We live in a time when innovation is all the rage. But what does this word really mean? Well, innovation is the creation of something new for the purposes of making a product that people will buy. We're told it's this innovation that will improve our quality of life, create new jobs. Invention, on the other hand, speaks simply to the creation of something new without judgment of purpose. Invention can play a key role in innovation, but there's more to it than that. We can also invent simply for the purposes of discovery. Now, when I think of invention for discovery, I like to think of it in terms of what we call a childlike curiosity. It's childlike curiosity is innate, and it's something that all of us are born with. For myself, I think back to lying in bed as a kid, reading a page from a book that explained how Velcro worked with all the little loops and hooks, I remember asking my parents seemingly innocuous questions. Like, why is the sky blue? This childlike curiosity doesn't have an agenda. It's simply a desire to learn something new. But when was the last time that you asked a question out of sheer curiosity? Something happens. We stop asking these questions. Why do we stop? Well, I believe we're trained out of asking these questions as we learn to become more productive, efficient members of society, taught to achieve outcomes rather than explore. And in light of this, what I want to dig into here is what really is the value of this curiosity to our society? So I want to start with an example from the medical field, that of magnetic resonance imaging, better known as MRI, also happens to be my field of expertise. Now, who here has ever been in one of these MRI scanners? Quite a few of you. Well, MRI is really well known for its ability to safely image, safely image inside the human body. And it's this ability that has meant it's become an invaluable tool in modern medicine for the diagnosis of diseases from brain tumours to all kinds of sporting injuries. But what fewer people realise is that MRI is actually an application of a quantum physics concept first discovered in 1937. Now, quantum physics is inherently abstract deeply mathematical. So in our attempts to understand it, we draw pictures. And the picture that was drawn in 1937 was that of nuclear magnetic resonance. Now, when I say resonance, what I mean is that it was found that if you took a nucleus, put it in a magnetic field, then directed a radio wave towards it, towards it that nucleus would sing back to you, just as if it were a tuning fork. But it wasn't until the 1970s that this discovery became MRI, the key insight which arrived about 40 years later, was that if you took many nuclei, put them in different magnetic fields, they'd each sing to you at a different frequency. It's very much in the way that you would expect each of these wine glasses to each resonate at a different frequency or pitch. And it was this insight that led to the first human MRI scan in 1977. Now, when scientists discovered nuclear magnetic resonance, they weren't doing so with the expectation that they would transform modern medicine. They were simply exploring. And of course, the power of this curious exploration extends beyond medicine. GP GPS, which many of you use to find your way here tonight, I'm guessing, um, came about after a bunch of scientists at MIT were simply trying to build a system to track the newly launched Sputnik satellite, just for fun. No one told them to do it. Lasers are crucial to modern communications technologies, including the internet. Now, they came about nearly 40 years after the enabling theory of stimulated emission was first written down. And so what we see time and time again is that it's these most abstract ideas that often do the most to progress our society in the long term. But if we rewind to that point when they were discovered, we see that these applications weren't known. And I believe this tells us something important, which is that the value of this curiosity needs to be intrinsic. And the knowledge we create needs to be able to stand on its own two feet, irrespective of some future hypothetical applications. But increasingly, that's exactly not the way that we're valuing research. Discoveries without a foreseeable short-term application are under threat. The way this manifests itself is that we evaluate research in terms of its impact, which is essentially a judgment of the effect the work will have on the economy, the environment, society, what value will it deliver now? Scientific journals are ranked on the basis of a system that measures their impact 
as the number of times their articles are cited in just two years after publication. And of course, what all of this leads to is a deprioritizing of long-term discovery at the expense of short-term goals. Every university now has an innovation strategy, and every university is looking to see what value it can deliver in return for industry partnerships. This is a situation where the value of science can only ever be evaluated on a five to 10 year timescale. But of course, these pressures for value now extend beyond the research domain. In the corporate world, companies used to write 10 year plans. Now they're writing two year plans. In part, this is a reflection of a rapidly changing world, but it's also a sign of lower risk tolerance. A sign that we're only willing to invest in things that we can see being successful over the short term and a reluctance to explore the unknown for fear that nothing of monetary value will be found. But if we really want to see this innovation that we claim to value so highly thrive for the decades to come, we need to keep finding the abstract ideas. And of course, doing this means finding a balance. It means pushing back on those short-term goals to create a space for curiosity to just exist. Really, this is a classic problem. Do we prioritize the short term or the long term? Now for myself, I try to carry this childlike curiosity into my work where we're looking for new ways to track cancer drugs. Cancer, of course, is one of the biggest health challenges facing our society. It's predicted that one in four children born today will eventually die from cancer despite decades of work looking for a cure. The problem is that we haven't worked out a way to kill cancer without killing the person who has it. Now, a key step in overcoming this is the development of targeted chemotherapy drugs that can be selectively delivered to tumors, such that they spare the rest of the otherwise healthy person from their toxic effects. But of course, to do this, we need to know where those drugs are going. And that's why as part of my work here at the University of Sydney, we've been developing new non-toxic markers for use with MRI. And the material we've chosen for this is one of the most inert substances known to humankind diamond. Now, if we can attach chemotherapy drugs to these tiny, tiny diamonds, which are also known as nanodiamonds, it could give us an entirely new way to see where these drugs go in the, bottom, in the body. But a problem we've faced is that conventional MRI just isn't sensitive enough to image these nanodiamonds. So how are we trying to overcome it? Well, we're looking to the abstract ideas from the past, of course. We found that by using a process known as hyperpolarization, which was first discovered in the 1950s, we can boost the signal from our diamonds by a factor of 10,000. Now, if MRI is listening to just one nuclear scene, MRI with hyperpolarization is listening to a well-trained choir. And when we do this, we find that our diamonds become beacons, showing us their location in the body like lights on a Christmas tree. And in case any of you are wondering, I've checked. The inventors of hyperpolarization never predicted their work would be used for imaging diamonds. Now, the payoff of work like this could potentially be huge, but the risk that it'll never lead to a profitable product in the long term is just too high for, company, for most companies to bear. And in light of this, we do need to be realistic. In the corporate world, there's always going to be a need for profit. But that doesn't mean we can't change our perspective. And I believe the first step in doing this is we really need to learn to pause before we ever ask that question, What's it good for? And of course, doing this can pay dividends in the corporate world as well. Google is famous for having taken a step in the direction of creativity with what's called 20% time. Now, under 20% time, employees are encouraged to spend up to 20% of their time working on projects that just interest them. Now, the important point is whether or not a given employee ever actually uses all this time, it helps to create an environment where people feel safe to spend time exploring projects that may be ultimately doomed to fail. And what Google has found is that up to half of its new product lines have come out of work initiated during this 20% time. Other big, technologies, sorry, other big technology companies, such as Atlassian, based here in Australia, are developing similar programs in attempts to bolster creativity. And really, what all these programs are are an acknowledgement that at the core of the innovations that do the most to progress our society is curiosity, not profit. Because at the end of the day, innovation isn't bad, but it can be short-sighted. We need to refine our childlike curiosity and treasure the abstract ideas. Thank you. <laughs>